In that case, I think I might uh, start with the introduction. Thank you very much, everybody, for coming here today. Uh, it's now three o'clock, so I'll just introduce the speaker and hopefully some more people will join us uh, while I'm yabbering on, because what I say is not really what we're here for. We're here because from the land of Kyushu in Japan's deep south, behold, Jose Domingo Cruz has entered the Zoom room for us today. And um, a lot of people actually know Jose already. He's fairly famous, especially in the Facebook group of OTJ. Um, and he's famous, especially for being the Zoom guy. Um, that's actually probably because uh, early in the pandemic, Jose was running Saturday night Zoom sessions where basically everybody was struggling. And he just said, well, I've got a Zoom account. So let's learn how to use this Zoom thing together so that we're all prepared for next semester. And he was just taking time out every Saturday night and giving people control of the Zoom room and letting them actually uh, learn how to use Zoom. That was kind of awesome. And that's actually where I first really started to get to know Jose, um, although I had actually met him 20 years earlier. Mm. Um, anyway, after that, he actually became even more the Zoom guy when he wrote the book <laughs> on Zoom, on teaching with Zoom. So uh, this is by uh, Ways Goose Press, uh, published by Ways Goose Press, and there you can see I can I'm not joking. That is him. Yeah. Um, great book, and uh, even though the Zoom has changed a lot since that book was published, it's still a good book, and I would still say it's worthwhile going through it and reading it, especially as a reference, as you know things like that. So recommended book, book recommendation too. See bonuses. <laughs> okay. Um, before the pandemic was well though. He wasn't the Zoom guy back then because Zoom, before the pandemic as well, Zoom wasn't really that much of a thing. He was the fluency guy, the goldfish, the 365 of the goldfish. And that's what he's talking about with us today. In Jose's presentations on fluency, I've been to several. And I can tell you, you're in for a treat because he is going to tell you about what I have mentioned in Matsuyama. I called the best thing you can do in classrooms. Right. This is this focus on fluency will get your students talking and even high level, low level. It doesn't matter. It will get them talking. Trust me, I work at a low level in terms of English, at least low level. Uh, it's an engineering university. They hate English just a <laughs> little bit less than they hate me when they walk in the door. And by the end of classes at, say, 15 weeks, they're talking because we're doing the verbal classrooms method. So um, I'm going to let him uh, talk to you all about that. In the links, though, I am going to post a few links to the chat right now. And you can see that is uh, his Goldfish 365. That is Jose's um, WordPress page, where he has a whole bunch of materials free for anyone to use. The YouTube channel, where you can actually learn more about this Verbal Classrooms uh, lesson. Take that one down, because you're going to want to watch more about this after this presentation. I guarantee you. Welcome, uh, online teaching uh, Japan, is, where he is also um, <laughs> uh, online teaching Japan also where Jose is a massive contributor to the extent that people thinks he owns the online teaching <laughs> Japan page he doesn't he's just a nobody like me but um, <laughs> but he participates so much and he runs online teaching Japan's OTJ TV. Uh, every month, you know, a different speaker telling their stories and things like that and giving a platform for people to communicate. He's been doing this all the way through the pandemic. It has been a massively positive and beneficial effect on the entire field. So um, <clears throat> me, on the other hand, I'll just be quiet now and hand you over to the greatness that is Jose Domingo Cruz. Thank you. Yeah, I want to, yeah. Uh, I just I just want to just sort of tamp that down a bit. I don't know about the greatness that is Jose Cruz. Uh, I'm I have several phenomenons sort of like uh, moving around me, but I am very grateful for the introduction as the fluency guy. I would like to be known as that. Uh, the Zoom guy. I'm I'm happy that people got something out of what I did during the pandemic. But yeah, let's talk about something that I think can help not just your remote classes, but also mm. your can we just let people know that uh, you'll be putting this up to YouTube? Yes. 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 Uh, you're, you're, you're being recorded. So uh, if you haven't figured out 
you were told that at the very beginning. If you want to change your name or if you turn on your camera, please be careful. But this will be recorded and this will be put up uh, as something that people can access um, either from the Shizuoka page or from my own YouTube uh, recordings page. So um, if there is a problem with that, please uh, raise your hand and, and, and mention that. Um, in any case, uh, where was I? Uh, fluency. Well, let me get to my slides. Um, I have been thinking about fluency now, oh gosh, ever since I um, ran into uh, this method, when it was first sort of in its, um, mm, let's say, um, proto phase uh, back in the, the mid-1990s. And back then, it was just uh, a way to get, no, I shouldn't say just, it was a way to get um, freshman salary men at companies to start exercising the English that they brought with them from um, the universities where they had graduated. And these were salary men who were already at around a TOEIC 600, 700, because these were elite companies like uh, Sumitomo or Fujitsu or Shinitetsu. And... Um, it was a very successful intensive course. And um, as I encountered that, hey, maybe that's what I can do in university. And when I first started doing it in university, <clears throat> um, it was successful enough, but there were a few problems in number one, I was just basically taking the method as it was and um, applying it very roughly to my university classes. But the more I thought about the problems that it was encountering, mostly with um, the, the fact that my first year university students had to do a bit more of a jump in terms of getting to where these freshman salarymen were assumed to be, I thought, how can I create a bit more scaffolding? How can I not dumb it down, but bring it to their level? And um, it made me think a lot more about the idea of fluency, what fluency actually is. And it made me want to do some more research into what has already been said about what fluency is. And one of the first places I looked was um, uh, the, the, the documentation that is around the Sefer. Now, if you look at what the Sefer says about it, it doesn't really talk about fluency until you get to the B2 level. From A1, A2, and uh, B1, fluency is not something that is assumed that you're going to have at those levels. And I don't know if that's absolutely correct, but we can talk about that a little bit later. But even at the B2 to C2 level, you can see that the definition of fluency itself is kind of vague. The Sefer is a, a list of can-do statements. You can do this, you can do that. But the only place where it actually mentions fluency in B2 is here where it says a degree of fluency. In C1, you raise the level a bit more and so say express ideas fluently. And then in C2, very fluently. And I'm not sure that those descriptions of fluency as you go through levels was anything that I could use to actually um, gear my exercises towards. And certainly it wasn't something that I could sell to students if they came up to me and said, Mr. Cruz, I want to become uh, fluent in English. What are the steps that I have to take? I couldn't give them targets. You know, like I couldn't say something like, well, learn the first uh, uh, 280 words of the NGSL, um, read X number of graded readers, right, which are good, solid, almost mechanical targets. But in fluency, we don't really have a definition that we can use. And that was one of the first places where I started to work. What is fluency? When I first started um, working this, uh, this presentation, around the JALT uh, chapters uh, from Oita and Kitakyushu and Fukuoka, um, I would start by asking, you know, in the days when we were uh, more often um, meeting in a room together, how do you define fluency? And for a lot of people, the definition of fluency was actually quite difficult. People would say things like, um, well, eloquent speech, um, uh, speaking without stopping, uh, well, fluency, one person actually said, well, fluency to me is the ability to speak with complexity, accuracy, and fluency. And, and that's not only the one time that I would hear that definition, that the word fluency was used to actually define the concept of fluency. But that's a tautological definition. It'll never work. So I started thinking about it. And I thought to myself, well, what makes someone fluent at the top level, what makes someone not fluent, and what makes someone fluent at the minimum level? And it was at that minimum level that I started to think to myself, 
when do I start listening to, when I'm listening to someone, when do I start saying, wow, they're actually fluent and where it's going to be a gray zone, but where are they or what are their traits in terms of speed and smoothness with a language when I think, yeah, close, but no cigar, you're not quite fluent yet. Well, I think about it this way. When you're talking about speed, you're not just talking about speed in your speaking, you know, your per word speed. You need to have speed in your responses and you need to have speed in your idea creation. So even if you can actually peel off a pretty good, um, you know, 10 word sentence from a book with good pronunciation, but it takes you a long time to, to respond to simple questions, or it takes you a long time to, uh, to create new ideas, to, to, to participate in a conversation. Your speed is too slow to maintain normal fluency in a conversation. So those three areas, your ability to speak quickly per word or per sentence, your ability to respond to inquiries or to respond to the timing of a conversation and the new ideas that you can make so that you can provide more to the conversation itself. But there was another aspect of this, which is how smoothly you speak. So in the, the concept of speaking speed, you have to be able to speak smoothly between the words and between the sentences that it is that you're going to speak. And measuring that is something that we also take on, and I will give this definition with the warning that this is my hypothesis. I have never been lucky enough to have enough of a research uh, grant size that I can actually pay some students to um, undergo a test and, and um, deliberately uh, have people judge to say that was fluent, that was not fluent. But in terms of my um, experience, 110 to 120 words per minute is minimal fluency. 120 words per minute is about two words per second. And if you speak about two words per second, you sound like this. And if you can actually maintain that rate, that's not so bad, right? But if you speak less than that, if you're down to around 90 words per minute uh, or less, uh, you'd be surprised. Most of the students that we think actually speak English well are actually below 110 words per minute. Anything above 120, 130 words per minute, I've done my own research on uh, the, the, the things that I can use. And there are some native speakers who speak at about 130 words per minute. Me, I can easily speak at about 170, 180 words per minute. Uh, and when I get really excited, 200, 220 words per minute. But that thing about smoothness, okay, that's where you talk about mean length runs. And a mean length run, statistically, is the idea of how many syllables you can utter until you run into a disfluency. And a disfluency, uh, very roughly, is measured as uh, an uncontrolled utterance. So for example, you'll hear very often, I'll say words like um or uh, and everyone has their pet sort of um, pause word. I mean, you know, so like those can be considered disfluencies and especially for native speakers, they are. Now, I sort of have to do a little bit more research on this, but the idea of disfluency actually can be a bit of a fluency crutch. Uh, when you're trying to maintain 110 to 120 words per minute, sometimes those ums can actually be quite handy to keep your engine running so you don't end up just completely pausing. But a mean length run is normally measured in syllables, and it's normally uh, something to the order of about oh, 25 or 30 syllables which usually means about eight words because the average word is about three syllables, two or three syllables, okay? So if you can say up to eight words in one long string consistently without having a lot of pausing and maintaining 110 to 120 words per minute, okay? That is what I would consider fluent. And if you think about it as an example, my favorite example is just this. Mr. Cruz, is my homework due this Thursday? Those are eight words. And when was the last time any of our students, even our good ones, can come up to you very quickly and say, Mr. Cruz, is my homework due this Thursday? Or even at the lower speed, Mr. Cruz, is my homework due this Thursday? They'll say it and they'll pause. Mr. Cruz, is my uh, homework uh, due this Thursday? 
that is what I wouldn't call fluent because there's a lot of starts and stops in it. The smoothness isn't there. The speed might be at around 110 words per minute, but you have to meet both of these definitions. Measuring something like this is actually not that hard. So if you wanted to do this with your students, you would just basically take a smartphone and have them install an app uh, that I, you know, I can, I can recommend this one. Countess is a good one. There are a whole bunch of them. You basically would search under thumb counter or counter, and uh, you'll find an app like Countess. Get them to basically sit across from each other, and you can do it either aided by having them read aloud or having them, let's say, um, describe their breakfast that morning, and they pair off, and one person will just hit the thumb counter as they're speaking, and the other person will just try to speak as, as well as they can. Um, you can be at the front and say, okay, that's 60 seconds, stop, and then you'll get the count, they switch, and then you'll see how many words they can say it, uh, per, per minute. That's actually a very handy thing to show how their fluency uh, has improved from the beginning of the class to the end of the class. If you want to do that, it just gives them a bit of a boost at the end of the class, because naturally, if you do a lot of fluency exercises for the next 80 minutes, 70 minutes, pardon me, uh, they'll be able to see that that's uh, something that um, if you do it a lot, you're going to be able to uh, improve your fluency. So that's basically what a thumb counter looks like right there. Okay. Now, if you get that, then, uh, you know, you, you, you basically, you, you measured your fluency already. Now, what is this thing called verbal classrooms? Um, as I said, this started uh, in 1995 with um, uh, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the program called Using What You Know. And I took it and I cut it up into 15 sessions uh, gave it an assessment system. And basically, I can define it as this. It's a way of instructing students using set sentence patterns and changing the way that you think about how you instruct so that it's based around the idea of teaching a skill set and using that scaffolding to get them from... You can assume that they have zero experience in speaking, which does not equate to zero knowledge of English. They probably have plenty of knowledge of English, but their experience in actually uttering it can be, should be effectively considered zero because that lets them start from a very, very easy point. And if you um, prioritize it well, and you, you do a lot of these face-up speaking exercises, you can create what I call a no-fail classroom where everything that they do, they know that they can pull off. A lot of the time our students will go into a classroom and then um, they, they have some expectations of it. Some are more shy, some are less shy. But um, if they have enough instances, situations where the teacher is asking them to do something and either the instructions were poor or the challenge was too difficult for them or it was too easy for them, the classroom has failed in the sense that um, you get consistent sort of involvement from the students. And what I think verbal classrooms does really, really well is make sure that the students are engaged from the very moment that you start asking them to do something. So I'm about to show you a video from one of my classes. There's already too much talking on my part about what this is all about. But before I show you the video, um, it's a video of me uh, doing a demonstration class. And immediately behind me, uh, what will be written is this, okay? Seven uh, pronouns going logically from I to they, and there is no uh, second person plural because in terms of grammatical accuracy, it's exactly the same as the second person singular. So it goes I, you, he, she, it, we, they, conjugated with the be verb uh, in the present tense. That's what's written on uh, behind me in this video. So let's take a look at this video. And um, let me see here. I just want to make sure that I've optimized this. Oh, there you go. Yeah, I've got to make sure I optimize this. Oh, there you go. Okay, and um, let's My watch this video. wrote this up for me. Oh, gosh, no. What is that? That's uh, 46 years ago? Holy cow. Okay, uh, when I first went to Canada. And, and one day she said, Jose, stand up, say all of this in a big, loud, fast voice. And I would stand up and I would say, 
I am, you are, he is, she is, it is, we are, they are. Very good, two times, faster, louder. I am, you are, he is, she is, it is, we are, they are. I am, you are, he is, she is, it is, we are, they are. Now, I bet if I asked one of you right now to do that, you couldn't. And you are university students who've studied English for six years. Just goes to show you, all the studying you do doesn't get you ready for speaking. So we're going to speak today. First thing we're going to do, I want you to turn around in your chairs 90 degrees. Turn around 90 degrees. Turn around and face your partner on that side. Just no, turn around in your chair. Yeah, just turn around in your chair. You don't have to turn the chair. Just turn around in your chair. Good, okay, there you go. Good. Okay, and this is what we're going to do. I'm going to show you how to do this with you. Okay. Take it from the first line. Somebody, when I say ready, go, first line. Okay. You will, I, I'll go with I am. You'll begin with you are, and I'll continue with he is, she is, and we'll continue from there. When we get to the bottom, we go back to the top. Ready? I'll start. I am. Uh, you are. He is. She. It is. Look at me. Look they at me. are. They are. I am. You are. He is. She is. It is. We are. They are. I am. You he are. is. She it is. We are. It over here, over here, over here. <laughs> Very difficult, yeah? Yes. But it looks so easy, yeah? Because yeah. looking at something in English, studying it on paper is nowhere near as difficult as looking at somebody in the eyes. So it's okay. If you want to look at this, go ahead. Take a look. You can check the order. You can check whatever it is you want. But when you speak to a person, learn to go from paper to a person's eyes. Look all you want, but when your mouth moves, you go back to the person. Okay, when I say ready, go, somebody begins. Look at your partners. Ready, go. I uh, also forgot to mention that if you do have a question, if you have a comment or anything, as uh, Greg McNabb just uh, uh, very nicely put into the chat, please put it into the chat. And um, I'll try to keep my eye on the chat. I'm not very good at that when I'm doing a presentation. But if there's something important, I'm sure Sue or Adam will be uh, uh, more than happy to, to point it out to me. But uh, Greg McNabb says, these students must be rather fluent because your speaking speed is normal, not at all slowed down. Um, this class was at about a TOEIC average of 500 or so, and they were not what I would call fluent. None of them met that fluency definition that I had, uh, not completely. Actually, the one who is probably closest to being fluent is this girl that the frame ended up on. Her name is Haruka, and there was another girl. Um, these are students at a, at a national university and another one at a semi-public uh, university uh, here in Fukuoka. And um, I'll be honest with you, normally when I teach this class, I teach it in Japanese. But at the same time, what I wanted to show when I made the arrangement to do this with the, um, the fellow in some of these videos that you'll sometimes see in the background, his name is Robert Long. He's the one that actually asked me using his Kakenhi grant money to do this demonstration video. I said, I wanna do this entirely in English. And I didn't really care who was in the, uh, the, the student participant audience. We basically just put out a call for anyone who would want to take part in this. Uh, we paid them 1500 yen for the afternoon. So we weren't asking for any particular sort of level of English. But of course, students who are going to volunteer for that are going to be fairly high level. But I want to do it entirely in English to show it can be done entirely in English. And if you watch um, not just this video, but my entire uh, YouTube demonstration video playlist, which I'll give you the link to at the end, I'm doing it entirely in English. And if you learn how to do a very important part of VC, which is to demonstrate well, what you say should not be at all important. If you can see the way I was demonstrating and the way you know, you're looking at people, look at me, look at me. If you learn how to go from a sort of chalk and talk lecture mentality to the idea of becoming a skills coach, the paradigm being like, basically like a, a coach for a baseball team or a coach for a hockey team, you know that these are skills. These are physical skills and you, they translate and, and are conveyed in a very different way. So even if you didn't understand what I said in English, 
as long as you actually provide the instruction through your gestures, through the, uh, the, the way that the class is laid out, and magically, by the fact that everyone is doing the same thing, it, it doesn't take any more than a third of them to actually understand what the teacher is doing until they all go, oh, that's what I'm supposed to be doing, and bang, they all go. Uh, by the way, uh, a question I get a lot is that, really? Wait a minute, Jose. You mean they really just start talking as soon as you ask? This was the first exercise I gave them. And um, yeah, they do. When I say ready, go, they all go exactly like that. Over 25 years that I've been doing this, not a single class have I had where I go ready, go the very first time that they didn't all automatically start going. Okay. Now, Imagine that as the first class, the first exercise of the first class. Now, if you are willing to actually take my entire curriculum over 15 weeks, okay, this is what you're going to get at the end of 15 weeks. This is a different class. This is an actually, this is actually a class. And I just had a moment to take my, my cell phone and pan it across. And because I didn't have the um, permission of all of these students, I had to blur it out. But they're even lower. This class I actually taught in Japanese. And this was week 13. This is the last new um, skills uh, based uh, information that we were trying before they actually did their group work for their assessment. And they were even lower than the class I just showed with the previous thing, but um, here's where they are now. You can see that they're animated, they're independent, they're, they're making jokes with each other, they're gesturing. Um, I choose the topic but I just say, okay, topic is sports, go. And they're like this. And yeah, some parts of it are, are kind of difficult sometimes for, for students. Sometimes it's a little bit uh, challenging, okay? But I would say that overall, uh, with that one disadvantage of the fact that for a lot of students, they're, they're going to be going, wait a minute, this isn't the sort of thing that um, is going to really help me with tests right? Uh, I, I have to take uh, the center test. I'm sorry, the, the common test next week. I have to take the ACAN next week. A lot of them will still be tricked into the idea that this kind of thing doesn't help them get ready for those tests. Well, uh, maybe we won't be hearing that so much uh, in the future because the common test, the ACAN already, TOEIC eventually, certainly IELTS and TOEFL have speaking components to their tests. And for a lot of these kids, um, maybe uh, for the next few years still, uh, a lot of the stuff they're doing is reading and writing, but they're going to have to learn how to do speaking as well, too. So that complaint might not be as relevant uh, in the coming years. But the advantages are fantastic. They actually address real speaking skills. And when you've got mixed level classes, this kind of practice is good for everyone. Whether you've got a TOEIC 650 matched up with a TOEIC 450, most of them have never had the experience of actually uttering words at high speed without notebooks or textbooks in front of them. And it really, really does help everyone in mixed level or in leveled classes, but at several different levels. The teachers themselves, though, have to consider, you know, the, the pros and the cons of all of this. And one of the cons is just the idea that you're exhausted uh, if you uh, haven't done this before. And it is hard to do if you've never done it before. But there are a lot of advantages. One of them is that there's a lot less marking to do. Um, the, uh, the L1 instruction is just as important as the L2 instruction. As a matter of fact, some of the parts when you're talking about um, fluency, or what is the concept of fluency, is better done uh, in L1 than it is in L2. So there's a lot of stuff there that's actually good and going on. So what you can have if you move over to a verbal classroom's focused uh, curriculum is you're going to maximize their speaking time and not just their the the classroom speaking is going to be all speaking the per person speaking time will will skyrocket because they're all talking at the same time and if you um you know um, do a lot of good flipped classroom work um, and you want to talk to adam about how to get your moodle to actually do more um flipped classroom work um you can get the entire class to be talking all the way from the, the beginning chime. Maybe you have a few things that, you know, a couple of announcements at the beginning, but all the way to the end, talking, 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 and everybody talking, not like, you know, okay, everybody break up into groups. And then maybe one person will say a couple sentences, 
dead pause for a minute and then somebody else says something. Not that, okay? This is everyone talking at the same time. When you've got to focus on fluency, you can get these kids to feel really much more motivated about the fact that, you know, finally I'm learning how to speak. And they're actually noticing for themselves because it's physical output where the real problems are. It's not like learning how to, to practice pronouncing the word uh, refrigerator 10 times at a time and going, okay, I got that. And you'll find out that you can't say refrigerator in a sentence. And that you can't really, not really, you can memorize some words for a test, but if you really want to internalize, not just memorize, internalize vocabulary, you have to be able to speak it so that then it's, it's like um, shelving in a room. You can buy a lot of books, but if you don't have any shelves in the room, you don't have any kind of an organization system that'll let you get to those books very quickly. You just end up with a big pile of books on the floor. Okay. Um, when you get to this one conjugation, you can change that from I am to I do to I go. Uh, just practice all the way through that. Do a few rounds of that. I'll show you later how I get those kids to do their seat switching. But if you go from the present tense, how about uh, the present tense with an adjective? I am sleepy. You are sleepy. He is sleepy. She is sleepy. It is sleepy. We are sleepy. They are sleepy. How about a negation? Um, I am hungry. You are hungry. I am not hungry. You are not hungry. And I want to show you um, something that I call stair stepping. Okay. You can take basically just this um, simple sentence I was in Osaka, four words. Okay. And you can use it as the base to build and stair step upon a sentence that you found in the textbook. So let's, let's watch how I stair step this. First, you start with I was in Osaka. Then you say to the kids, okay, now let's just tag this on, kids. I was in Osaka last week. Okay, well done. Now let's uh, put on a little bit more. I was in Osaka last week for a kendo match. Okay. That itself might have been the sentence, the target sentence in the textbook. You look at that target sentence. You start cutting it down into pieces until it gets into a simple subject verb object like I was in Osaka right? Or I was sleepy. Begin even there if you want to um, make it really easy for your students. Once you get to here, okay, which is basically just statements, you can move on to the next level of things where things get really, really interesting using um, an exercise I call the AQP, the answer question pattern. Because for our students, I think for me, when I started to talk to them a bit more and started to really pay attention to what they were doing in their independent conversations, they know the English, um, uh, in, the inquisitive form, the question form very well on paper. But to actually do it fluently in the middle of a conversation so that then there's no thinking, it's instinctive, is one of the hardest things for them to do because they've never practiced it to fluency. And I came up with, uh, I think this is one of my great contributions to this idea, is that um, why don't we drill that part using this system? So let's take a look at another video. This one's also about a couple of minutes long, but let's watch this. I have a very crazy way of doing this practice. Person starts at I go. When you make the question, you make it with the subject next in order. So if your answer was, I go, your question will use you. I go, do you go? Your answer to this question uses the same subject, which then takes the next subject. This question uses this answer, which then takes the next subject, and so on and so on. It looks hard, but actually, once you start doing it, it starts getting pretty easy. Well, let's take this slowly. Do you have any questions, dear? No. Okay, so I'll go slowly. I go, do you go? Hmm? I go, do you go? I you go, does he go? Good. He goes, does she go? She goes, do we go? Hmm. Next one after she. Uh, does it go? It goes, do we go? We go, do they go? They go, do I go? I you go. <laughs> they go, do I go? I go, do you go? You go, does he go? He goes, 
best you can. Very good. Do your best. Ready? Go. Yeah, that's where they're seat switching. You go this way. You go this way. You okay? Okay. If you need to look, you can look. But when you speak, you speak to my eyes. Ready? I go, do you go? You go, does he go? He goes, does she go? She goes, does it, uh, does it go? It goes, do we go? Uh, we go, da, do we, they go? Good, do your best. Ready, go! I go, do you go? You go, do you go? Okay, um, I'm, I was, us or usually I will take you guys right into a breakout breakout room here to try that but i realized i actually forgot to um get you guys to practice this so we're going to go into a breakout room to practice just this which is hard enough okay so i'm going to um first do a demonstration uh i will ask a volunteer either uh let's see adam would you like to volunteer <laughs> that's not really a volunteer thing because i'm asking you to do it sure thanks for volunteering me yeah there you go yeah that's that's what volunteering is all about um so this is the way that I you saw me do this with the one boy in the, the first video. And I am actually, at first when I he kind of hesitated to start, I thought, oh no, he's kind of hesitant. But it actually works out really well to show teachers that sometimes, you know, you, you can get over that initial hesitation because the, the request itself is so simple and you use your body language to show them where they're wrong. So um, if Adam was my student, I would say, Adam, you ready? Yep. I am. You are. He is. She is. It is. We are. They are. I am. You are. He is. She is. It is. Good. So that's basically what I'm going to throw you guys into um, a breakout room to do right now. The break. Thank you, Adam. And the breakout rooms are two minutes. There will be one room with three people. Okay. Now, for anyone uh, who, for everyone who goes into the room, let's make it so that then the first person in the room. Okay. You don't need to do a self-introduction and you don't need to, to worry too much about this. I will do my best to make sure when these breakout rooms open that you can see my slide shared into the breakout room. Although, have some pride as an English teacher. You know how this order goes. Logically, it goes first person, second person, third person, first person, third person, plural. You can remember all of that. But I will throw my slide in there. So first person in the room, you start with I am. Second person in the room automatically takes second position. For the three people, just make it an ABC round. Does anyone have any questions before we go? A couple of minutes of this, okay? Everybody ready? Good luck, go. Just waiting for everyone to come back from their breakout rooms, which should finish up in about, oh, there you go, everyone's back. Great. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, before we go on, does anyone have any comments or any questions that they want to ask uh, after that first experience with verbal classrooms? Adi's new baby is very cute. That's my comment. <laughs> Say again, Sue. Adi's oh. new baby is very cute. That's my comment. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Far more but important. Yeah, it was good. No, no, we also practiced. We also did this as well. So. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. Uh, so let's go back to where uh, we were before, which is um, this slide. Now, I'll just explain it one more time, okay? The basic idea is to find a way to drill these questions because the idea of taking the subject and the verb and then switching them over to verb subject is something that's very easy to explain, but to actually do in the middle of a conversation is really hard. And for those of us who speak Japanese, I equate it with my the difficulty I had in the first few months of learning how to do it and it being that in Japanese, you have to wait to drop the verb in, in a simple sentence, until the very end. And that, that, that dissonance in your mind of waiting to put the verb at the very end is, I would say, if anything, a little easier than what students have to do to be able to make a question. So 
it starts with the first person. This time, they don't just say the statement form, subject verb. They actually follow up subject verb with verb subject. But you make the question, okay, the interrogative with the subject that follows in order from the subject that you used in the original statement. The person who then answers you uses. So you see, you were asked with the subject you. You answer with the same subject as it was in the question. Then you follow the same line of reasoning. You take the next subject in order. In this case, you said you are, so is he. You were asked is he, so you answer he is. Uh, this time, another um, VC veteran, Mary uh, Virgil Uchida. Can I get you to do this demonstration with me? We good? I think so. Okay. Oh, pardon, mistake though. Okay. No, you won't. No, you won't. <laughs> I am. Are you? You are. Is he? He is. Is she? She. She is. Is she? Ah, no. <laughs> he is. Is she? No, that's what you said. <laughs> she okay. is. Is it? Okay. It is. Are we? <laughs> we are. Are they? They are. Am I? I am. Are you? Good. So thank you, Mary. Um, you can see that even. Even a native speaker who is not used to this drill will have a tendency to flub. That has two advantages, if you ask me. One, it helps you as the instructor feel a little bit more empathy to your students in terms of what it is that they have to do. It also helps because of that empathic feeling. It tells you where they might have problems. And as you watch their faces when they're doing demonstrations, you can tell, oh, that, that kid is having problems because he just hasn't memorized the entire uh, sequence of pronouns. Or that kid is having problems because they're not quite clear on what the third person singular uh, is doing in terms of the S sound or the Z sound at the end of things. It helps you get into their heads. It helps you actually show too that you can make mistakes and there's a little bit more of a bond that is created from there. Okay, I'm gonna put you guys into breakout rooms again. And for that, I will recreate these rooms. Okay, and so that you can get slightly different partners. And I think now, Ah, there is no three-person rooms it looks like, so that's good. Um, does anyone have any questions before we go into the rooms? No. Okay. So let's uh, try this. And this time, actually, I will make it not two minutes, just one minute. It didn't look like there were a lot of problems. So I'll make it much shorter. And um, yeah, and we'll uh, close out the rooms. So it'll close out uh, at about one minute and 15 seconds eventually. We'll be all, we'll all be back by then. Okay. Uh, good luck, everyone. We needed more time, Jose, with that one. Okay. You did? Okay. I'll, I'll try to, I'll try to uh, increase the time. Um, one of the things that I kind of miss about online classes, uh, when I do VC, a lot of people will come back up into the main room after the breakout rooms are finished, and they're all smiling because they were all giggling and laughing uh, in, in the breakout rooms. And it's, it's quite endearing to see that they were actually having a good time in those breakout rooms. Keeping it short, too, um, makes it easy for them to not get too bored with it. When I'm actually doing this in the classroom, I think most of the time I keep each exercise down to about 45 seconds at a time. Uh, when you get to about a, a minute, uh, that starts to get a little bit old. Uh, you can feel the energy start to deflate a little bit. Uh, a minute in this case would be good because you know people have to get into the room, out of the room and stuff, but uh, you guys are brand new at this. And yeah, uh, with a brand new class, I would probably give a little extra time too. Does anyone want to comment uh, on anything else before we uh, continue? No? Okay. Oh, uh, Mary. I have used this with elementary age kids. So I just wanted people to know that it can be used with younger people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. I, I have used this uh, with kids as low as second year junior high school, but I wouldn't be afraid to do it with um, elementary school kids. Uh, you just have to make sure that they have the right vocabulary. Um, if you're going to be talking about a topic like, let's say, cooking, then you give them names of vegetables and names of different ingredients and names of different kitchen utensils, and uh, they'll be able to do that. I cook with, I cook on, uh, I teach them prepositions and stuff like that. Yeah. And uh, Mary would know. Uh, she, uh, she runs a very successful uh, school with lots of little kitties in it, right? And 
the be verb is the hard one though. And so that's why the simple present tense, yeah, that was so simple for them. And their fluency really developed. So really, okay, good. Glad yeah. to hear it. But not only is the sorry, sorry, Jose, I should have yeah. put my hand up. Um, it's similar to a jazz chant too, though, wouldn't you say in some ways? Uh yeah. Uh, I've never it's actually that way. Sorry, I didn't catch that. Or, or could be used that way. Why not? Why not? Um, one thing, though, I, I don't know because I've never taught jazz chants. I've only mm -hmm. seen them and I thought that's something I want to try. And I never had a chance uh, when mm -hmm. I was still working in Akaiwa to actually do it. But mm -hmm. I thought when I was comparing it to what VC did, the, the odd times that I would think about jazz chants is I'm not really sure because I don't know where jazz chants go mm -hmm. in terms of directly leading into independent um, improvised conversations. Mm, I think they can, but yeah. Mm, mm. Mm. But um, yeah, definitely. You know, you jazz chance is still on the idea that if you want to learn a language, you have to output. Yeah. You can't just read it. And the amount of time that you output is limited if you're still doing things like um, discussing global warming in a group of five. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in this case, it's like right down to the basics. Let's just get this out of our faces. And then maybe we can discuss global warming or whatever you want to discuss in pairs or in fives. But now you'll be more fluent. So you, you get the, the basics, the underpinnings first, right? That's what Jazz Chance does as well, too. Be verb, do verb, uh, future tense, past tense, whatever you want to do, okay? Um, so I do, do you, you do, does he, he does, does she, uh, after a while, uh, I'm sure a lot of people are probably flubbing the first time around in the breakout rooms, but after a while, this becomes very instinctual. Okay. And you can go on from, um, irregular verbs to regular verbs. And this is where the real trick lies because this is hard doing irregular verbs for these kids where they have to have both the auxiliary verb and the infinitive form of the, the, the main verb with meaning, the main verb, is something that is really tricky in their heads. When they look at it, they're using it a different part of their brain. And so when they look at it, they go, yeah, they understand. But actually, you know, pushing it out their faces is a completely different skill. So they, uh, the kids were think, considered themselves like really high level. Suddenly they realize, oh my God, I can't really speak English. I know English, but I can't speak it. Then from there, you do what I did before with like, uh, I was in Osaka. So it would be, I was in Osaka last week for a kendo match. Were you in Osaka last week for a kendo match? You were in Osaka last week for a kendo match. Was he? No, 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 no. One of the other things that you can do is do what I call a double variable conjugation, uh, where you take these longer sentences of like, I have Netflix on my phone is six words. So you're starting to get up to that, uh, that very important hurdle, that very important milestone of eight word sentences, because do you have Netflix on your phone is actually seven words. But this is difficult not just for the fact it's got difficult vocabulary, it doesn't, not for the fact that it's actually long, it isn't, it's starting to get long, but it isn't really, certainly not for a native speaker, but because it has two variables in it. One is the, um, the first person singular pronoun, then the possessive pronoun. And they all know what the possessive pronoun list is, but to do it like this, I have Netflix on my phone, do you have Netflix on your phone? So I think we have a little extra time and um, let's see, uh, who would like to, would anyone like to volunteer uh, apart from Adam or Mary uh, to, uh, to demonstrate this is with me before I, I throw everyone into breakout rooms? Sue, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, shall Tell we? Tell me what I have to do though. What am I doing? <laughs> so you're basically going to be doing this as we did before with I do, do you, okay? Okay. This time, the key sentence is, I have Netflix on my phone. Right. And the question follows. So, and your variables are there in gold. Those are the variables that you, that you switch in and out. Okay. All right. Let's see. Okay. Here we go. <laughs> I have Netflix on my phone. Do you have Netflix on your phone? You have Netflix on your phone. Does he have Netflix on his phone? He has Netflix on his phone. Does she have Netflix on her phone? has Netflix she, she, she. On, she she has Netflix on her phone does it have Netflix on its phone good okay good 
There you go. So let's try that one too, okay, in uh, a breakout room. And uh, I raised the time up to two minutes, Sue. So you guys will have a little bit more time with this. And I will shoot this into the breakout rooms as, uh, as a shared screen. Okay, everybody, let's give that. Oh, wait, I have to check again. There were some people who were not in breakout rooms. So yeah, okay, one room will be three people. Uh, but I'll recreate that down to five rooms. One, ooh, well, now that's interesting. I guess one person came back. Okay, I'll recreate that back up to six people. Okay, here we go. Everybody ready? There you go. And here comes everybody back. Okay, good. Anyone want to make a quick comment or... Uh, a percolating question that they uh, they want to throw out there? Hand up, or if you just want to open up your microphone, that's cool too. I don't have Netflix on my phone. <laughs> Do you have Netflix on your phone? No. Sorry. I don't have Netflix oh, on Actually, my that's, phone. That's, very, that's a very easy and a very relevant sort of quick um, way to create variations on this is just go to negation. If they feel that they're getting good with that, um, one thing I don't do, though, is I don't often negate the question. Negative questions, uh, tag questions, take a little bit of an explanation about in what context would you say, don't you have Netflix on your phone? And I don't want them to get confused. Although, actually, the explanation is fairly simple. You tell them it's basically the same idea as negating a question in Japanese. But um, it can screw them up. And I want them to just at least be able to have the basic neg negation process in the statement first. Mm. Oh, Could you please. possibly just have the negation in the answer? Say that again, Sue? Could you possibly just have, uh, maybe I haven't got my volume up. No, no, I, no, I, I hear you. Um, could you. Could you possibly have the negation just in the answer? Like tell them not to put it in the question, you yeah. know? Uh, that would be a true, true or false, their choice. That's, that's right. Yeah, just yeah. if you had a more advanced class or, you know, as you were uh, going along. Sure. No, I, I usually, like I said, that's usually what I do when I do negation. Yeah. It's only in the yeah. answer. I don't only put it in the, in the question. Yeah. Right? yeah, yeah, yeah. So another uh, variable to this. Oh, Mr. Jenkins. Yeah, I was just going to say on the, the phone thing as well, when it comes to we and they, I often get my students as well to change the phone to plural. Mm -hmm. so on our phones, do we have Netflix on our phones? We have mm -hmm. Netflix yes. on our phones. Do they have Netflix on their phones as well? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's even a, a third little variable thing that... Um, uh, third thing that they're tracking but learning to track that automatically is um where the drills come in really shine i think and and that's something that i think we lose track of as we try to get these kids to do things like um um you know uh, past pre past progressive or uh you know um uh, doing relative pronouns like which the difference in which and what we're so focused on that, we forget that they haven't really mastered even plurals and singulars. And when they're constantly making mistakes through simple sentences because they were never given enough time to sufficiently practice them, that's a real, you know, that's a real heart crusher. Why am I practicing relative pronouns when I can't even say something like, do they have Netflix on their phones very fluently? And they go, oh, my English must be really bad. No, it's not. It's just that you were never given enough time to practice. So uh, as I was showing in the, in the earlier slide, um, another set would be like this. Now, in this case, it's a little easier in a sense because the actual subject and verb conjugation doesn't change. It's only the possessive pronouns, my, and then the ob object pronoun, my and me, your and you. Those are the only ones that change. So once you start seeing your target sentences from your textbooks in different ways, and you start seeing how it can be turned into conjugation drills like this, you can do much more than just say, okay, well, pay att special attention to this sentence, kids. That's going to be on the test, okay? You actually get them to say it out loud, and you scaffold all the way up through, right? Uh, my grandfather plays tennis. Uh, does your grandfather play tennis? Your grandfather plays tennis only, and then the with me as the, uh, the next level lineup uh, is something you can go for miles. I can cook for myself, so that now you're um, showing them um, the modal verb, which is actually as simple as an irregular verb. So you can start throwing in things like um, uh, prepositions, okay? 
And as Adam was saying, uh, practicing plurals and singulars, this is one of my favorites for practicing that. I work as a cram school teacher on the weekends, which if they're alert, and I don't warn them about it, but it should come out of their mouths. We work as cram school teachers on the weekends. If they're alert and they know that, or even if they're not, you go, whoa, you missed something. And you don't say what it is. And they, they have to think about it. Oh, yeah, there's a plural in there. Well, what do they do for part-time work? What do we do for part-time work? That's not the problem. It's that, that article and then the plural S. That, like Adam said, is something that, uh, you know, you give them enough time to drill it, then it becomes fluent with them. You, you give them enough time to drill anything to become fluent on that. Now, that addresses the idea of speaking quickly. Okay, uh, because the pronouns and the verbs themselves are all written on the board. Uh, but how do you get them to start actually doing things that are a little bit longer? And what kind of hints do you give uh, for doing that? Before I start talking too much about it, I'm just going to show you this video and um, this kid who tried his best, but he, like a lot of students, still has a lot of psychological blocks to be able to control yourself enough to be able to speak a very long sentence. So let's take a look at this. A little bit difficult. I live in Kitakyushu with my sister. Do you live in Kitakyushu with your sister? I, my, you, your. Don't forget. So let's review. I, my, you, your, he, his, his she, are, it, it it's. it's. Now, especially that S. If that S is not there, it changes the meaning. We, oh, wow. our, they, there. there. Okay. <laughs> I live in Kitakyushu with my sister. Do you live in Kitakyushu with your sister? You live in Kyakushu with your sister with your sister. Does he live in Kyakushu with his sister? Good. Very good. But again, we come back to this practice. <laughs> perfect grammar. Pronunciation was perfect, but that was not fluent. So if we go go back to this. He lives in Kyakushu with his sister. If you feel confident, do everything in one breath. But try to do at least one sentence with no stopping, with a nice pace, all in one breath. Do your best. Ready? Go. Now, what I do sometimes in classes when I see a particular problem is I go to that particular pair and give them their coaching. With your sister, you were going up and down, and up and down. So smooth, smooth. Go, 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 go. It's not your fault. You okay? Okay. I know this is really hard. Yes. And a lot of you are you're going to want to stop to think about your English because that's the way you've always spoken English. But that unfortunately leads you to what we call broken English. You're going to stop all the all the time to speak. No. One breath. Ready? Uh, okay. Okay, number one, take a deep breath. Okay, here we go. I live in Kitakyushu with my sister. Do you live in Kitakyushu with your sister? You live in Kitakyushu with your sister. Da, uh, da. No, 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 no. Now, that was just because you were going too fast. You weren't ready. You. You wanted to force it. Don't force it. Take your time. If it takes a long time here, no problem. It will get faster. It will get better. But you must do it first correctly. 
Take your time. Do your best. Ready? Go. I have reached a change in my sister. sister. Do you have reached a change in your sister? Your sister? Your sister? Your sister? Thank you for indulging me for that long video. But I like to use that to show how I conduct my instructions in the classroom. The sentences that I give to these students hardly ever contains any information they didn't already see in high school third year. Most of it is high school second year. There isn't anything that needs to be explained. Maybe if the textbook demands it, I have to do things like relative pronouns and stuff. But a lot of that is review. What I try to focus on, my style of instruction that I can use with verbal classrooms is the idea that they need to practice this from a physical skill standpoint. So a lot of the hints that you're giving, a lot of the things that you're doing isn't about making sure that they know things. It's not about the information. Again, you can use flipped classrooms to check to make sure that they have their knowledge level up to snuff. But when you're in that really precious amount of time where they're with their friends and they're in front of you and you can monitor them and you can guide them. You focus on their physical skills. Maybe it's a psychological problem. She was just probably really nervous. Maybe it is a breathing problem. And that's where, you know, when you tell them, focus on your breathing so that you can actually feel yourself exhaling while you're speaking is something that helps them focus on something other than, oh, you need confidence. Oh, your, your, your pronunciation is bad. It's a very separate thing. It's a very physical thing. And that's the sort of thing that verbal classrooms will let you as an instructor learn to focus on because you've, you've changed your paradigm. You're now a skills coach. This is probably the longest sentence I've ever um, used to try uh, to get uh, my uh, students to say, I like watching Blu-rays at home more than going to the cinema. And believe it or not, it worked. After about a couple of turns, of course, it took a lot of scaffolding through the class, but this was uh, probably, yeah, this is, I think, the last sentence that I was doing in that 80 minutes, and they were able to peel it off. Of course, some were a little bit more fluent than others, and some, you know, you're going to have some of those kids that are just kind of going through the motions, but that's not a big deal. Um, that's just something that you learn to, to just ride with. I mean, you, you can't have brilliant students all the time, every time, every day, right? I'm going to jump ahead here to a different section of the, um, of the curriculum. And with the other things that I want to do, I'll probably be able to jump back. But I, I wanted to show you um, an exercise that I think is very useful even if you only want to use verbal classrooms as kind of a warm up or kind of a break in between things, there are still things that you can do as long as you know how to set up the dynamic seating, which is where the kids switch around in pairs, and that they know the general idea that when you give the command go, that they're ready to go. This is an exercise I call word throw. And what I do with the students is basically just tell them, okay, everyone, think of a word, think of an English word. Any English word is fine anything, as long as it's English, it's not Japanese English, it's only English, and you get ready to say that when I say go as quickly as you can. Now, of course, your partner will also be doing exactly the same thing. So once their word comes, as soon as they're finished uttering, you throw your word right back at them with the same speed. Now, what I want you to do is just keep throwing words back and forth, back and forth, word, 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 until I say stop. The words don't have to have any meaning with each other. The words don't have to have any meaning with what the other person said. As long as it's an English word, it's fine. Does anyone want to uh, try this with me as a demonstration? No hands up? Uh, I'll try again if you want. Okay, Sue. Yeah. And we're just throwing words, right? Yeah, we're just throwing any words out there. All right. You ready? Yep. Okay. Table. Tomato. Fork. Knife. Knife. Ooh, um, uh, 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 pot. Pan. Carrot. What did you say? Carrot. Oh, carrot. Uh, turnip. Mother. Father. You're doing what a lot of students will try to do, which is basically just take my word and bounce off it. That's right. Okay. <laughs> now, what I was doing, and I wanted to show them this, because most of them will try to do that, but they're going to get stuck by the third word. The cognitive okay. load for them is far higher than it is for us. Mm -hmm. Because with us, it's like, oh, you make me think of a carrot, then I can say turnip. They probably have never even heard of the word turnip, right? But 
for them, I tell them, listen, the easiest way to do this and still be able to do this kind of like a, a, the high speed uh, ping pong rally speed is to decide for yourself what you're going to be talking about before you begin. Make a theme in your head. My theme obviously was the kitchen. I imagined my mother cooking dinner. Uh, she's got the pots and the pans. She's got the ingredients. Uh, she's got a cutting board. And that image is in my head. And once the image is in my head, I just have to choose what words I can say in English and what words I can't. And I'll have at least seven or eight words ready to go. If not, maybe you need more time. But you are not doing yourself a service if you're trying to make things up as you go. You might be able to do that in your native language. But just like when I learned, and this is kind of the spiel that I give them, when I learned how to speak Japanese and Japanese conversation, I knew that because my Japanese was limited, that before I began the conversation, I had to start imagining how the conversation would go. So I remember one time I had to ask my, uh, my landlord for the combination to my mailbox, uh, combination lock again. And I had to learn the vocabulary and I had to assume, okay, if, he's, if I say this, he might say that, or he might say this. If he says this, and I'll imagine that. For a lot of you guys, and I'm talking to my students, you guys don't even begin to imagine what you're going to say before you go in. And that's why you get stuck at a lot of places because that's not something you do in your native language, but this is a second language and you have to learn how to do it. And this is a good place to do it in. Now you go word for word, And then you can go on to something called phrase throw. And this is a little bit more of, um, of a detailed kind of exercise, but basically you do word throw until they start having a little bit more fun. You can do variations on it and say, okay, all words have to be related to cooking. All words have to be related to music. All words have to be related to high school. And then they're bouncing words off each other. The vocabulary is building up. You can do this as an exercise after you've given them a couple of Quizlet sets to study overnight, or um, you've studied some Quizlet sets maybe just in the exercise before and they start doing this. They take it to the next level and you do something called phrase throw. A phrase throw is just the idea that now instead of one word, you do two words. But still the exercise is if you have no image, if you have no theme in your mind, this is going to get pretty hard by the third turn because you're, you're outputting twice as much. It's two words at a time. And I also tell them, try to imagine what you're seeing, not as a static image, but as a moving picture. You can see people doing things. You can see people moving in and out of the frame. You can imagine that frame so well, you can see colors. You can count the number of people. You can see where it is. You can see it in daytime. You can see it in nighttime. I sometimes take them through what is essentially a guided meditation where I ask them, can you see this in your imagination? Can you count the number of buildings? Oh, there were no buildings? Oh, you're in the forest? Okay, can you count the number of trees? Oh, there were no trees? Maybe you're in the desert. Okay, that's fine. As long as you know what you want to say and what you want to convey before you begin. After you've done phrase throw, then I start, start guiding them to the next thing, which is towards sentences. So I take the phrase throw itself. And at this point, it's still like any words. They don't have to have any grammatical connection to each other. But this time, one of the words must be a verb. It can be the first verb. It can be the first, uh, it can be the second word. It can be the first word. But one of them has to be a verb. The verb doesn't have to have any meaning with the other word. They can both be verbs. That's fine too. But one of them has to be a verb. And they start bouncing things off each other then. And sometimes they end up with, with you know, stuff that inadvertently or advertently has meaning. Stuff like sister, study, play, baseball, go, shopping, uh, carrot, cook, which is fine, right? Then I laid out for them after we've done enough of this and they've had a bit of fun. I say, now I've heard you guys speaking and I've heard you say stuff like this. Now, do you know that if you just take one more word, one more word in the top sentence, it required an object. In the bottom sentence, it required a subject. You will have a perfectly good subject, verb, object, phrase, sentence, object, uh, object clause. Okay, if you want to make it uh, a little bit longer, because uh, really you should say my sister studies English, but sister study English is 
perfectly meaningful. I completely understand that. I play baseball is perfectly grammatical. If you just remember to tell yourself that every time you try to say something in English, you need three parts, okay? Now, while not, okay, you could say every time to say it. There are exceptions, you know. If you say something like, really? Or no, no is a complete sentence. Um, those are complete sentences. But to train yourself, try to do it as a full sentence. No, I don't want to. Right? Then you're, you're learning something really basic that we always try to speak with subject verb objects. Then call that a complete idea. Sister study English is a complete idea. You don't have to call it a complete sentence because then sentence might connect with the idea of grammatical accuracy. Grammatical accuracy is not something that you really want to spend a lot of time on at this point because it it harkens back to maybe for their old, um, old hangups about, oh, I have to be perfectly accurate. And you move on to something called idea throw, where you're, oops, oops, got to go back. Sorry, <laughs> I got to go back. Move on to something called idea throw, where you're actually throwing ideas, full ideas. So that image that you have in your head, not only does it have to be a moving image, it, it should be like a movie, a good 15 seconds, 20 seconds of like a mini commercial uh, where you can see things. You can see a soccer ball being kicked. You can see a baseball being hit. You can see a, a football being punted. Then you'll, have, you'll be able to come up with plenty of ideas or whatever it is that you've got in your mind. Idea throw, whoops, multiple. Uh, so you start doing two ideas in a row. And once you've done two ideas in a row, you'll find that these kids naturally connect the two ideas to tell a little mini story. And you start encouraging them to say, well, you know, uh, if what he said was really interesting and you've got a new idea in your head that you can actually make two sentences about, go ahead, start a thread to a conversation. There's no problem with that. And once you've got that uh, that sort of conversational feeling going in a conversation, you say, okay, let's do idea throw multiple on this topic. Let's do it on this topic. And then in the demonstrations, you show that, um, you know, if you want to do three sentences, two sentences, I'm saying multiple, you can have two or three, we can have a real conversation. And at some point you can say, listen, let's take off those rules about how many sentences to speak or, or how many uh, uh, words to say in a sentence. Let's just have a conversation. Let's talk about sports, do the demonstration, let them be a little bit flustered, let them fumble a little bit. But most of the time, these kids follow what it is that you're saying. And when you show that you want to have a conversation, uh, especially if you've got material like a reading that you did previously, they'll be able to have a conversation on that. There are many ways to achieve independent conversation. This is one of the fastest ways. There are other ways that I've done uh, in verbal classrooms that unfortunately, the amount of time that we have left, I can't go into. But over a 15-week program. A lot of it is basically the idea of switching out words, um, lengthening sentences, uh, putting truth uh, to what it is that you want to do. Uh, got a comment here from Adam. The rules remove the anxiety. Yeah, it does. Once you start telling them, look, if you can still just say sister study English or say, oh, your sister study my sister, study, no, no sister. My sister, don't study. My sister, stupid. My sister, volleyball only, always volleyball. No study, only volleyball. Good volleyball player. She is a good volleyball player, but no study. You've got the beginnings to a conversation with interesting topics and engaging conversation uh, that's full of grammatical mistakes. But let them have their little moment in the sun where they said, I actually said something in English. And maybe if you want, you can correct some of those uh, mistakes later on. Or believe it or not, they will start correcting it themselves, especially if you team it up with things like video feedback or feedback systems, you know, live extemporaneous feedback from their, from their students. That's something that you can show them how to do as well. Okay. Now, oh, uh, Mr. Jenkins. Um, yeah, I was just going to say that um, on the anxiety thing, what I was saying is with my students, when I actually did this, uh, what I've found is previously when I jumped the gun and went straight to free conversation, uh, it flopped and it flopped because the students didn't really have the feel for where have you finished talking? Is it my turn? 
when when is it my turn when is it your when does your turn start and end when is my turn they didn't have a feel for how naturally to actually reach those boundaries and so to say okay he's going to say two sentences and then it's your turn mm -hmm. that's a rule that takes all doubt away and so they know exactly when they should talk and when the other person should talk and and things like that so practicing that and then after a while throwing that out really scaffolds free conversation so. another thing that i point on that that's a good point by adam uh, but when you get up to the point of independent conversation and i'm going to show the other avenue that you can use to attack independent conversation or attack to get to inter independent conversation you don't want to attack independent conversation um, is that they have never experienced independent conversation as second language speakers and they especially too if they had i don't want to say a bad experience but a very bottled experience um, in um, senior high school where the ALT was constantly asking a question and then they would answer and the ALT would ask another question. If they're not prompted, they don't know how to actually maintain a conversation. And with a phrase throw, multiple phrase throw, there are no questions in the phrases naturally because their questions aren't easy to make. So they're not going to make questions. What they'll say instead is, my father is very quiet. My father watches only TV. Ah, my father, same. My father, TV and fishing. Oh, fishing. I like fishing. I go fishing with father. Becomes a conversation because there isn't a lot of question and answer. At the same time, as a hint to my students, uh, when they're like, they, they have that sort of um, awkward moment as Adam was talking about because they don't know when their turn ends. What I tell them is that you don't know where your turn comes because maybe the other person didn't know how to show that they were finished. Even if, or especially if you don't have a rule as to how many sentences they can say, a lot of our students will go like this. Uh, my father fishing every day. My father goes fishing. And so, because they're they're trying to make their words too, right? So I try to tell them, okay, do yourself and your partner a favor. Plan where you're going to end. If you're going to say three sentences, count those three sentences, make them in your head before you go. And when you finish your last utterance, make it clear by your appearance that you're done. And the very easiest way to do that is when you're done with your last utterance, shut your mouth. If your mouth is still open like this, the other person is going to think you're about to say something. But if you shut your mouth clearly and give off that aura that I'm done, the other person will know immediately that it's their turn to speak. So these are things you can't learn looking at a piece of paper trying to study for the TOEIC test. It's, um, shut your mouth. Yeah, you can quote me because this is a recorded uh, recorded presentation. So I'm going to have to say, yes, you can quote me. Uh, I wouldn't quite say it that way, though. But in any case, yeah, just zip your zip your lips look at them as if you're done i'm finished uh, and that will tell the other person and then that's where you create that conversational rhythm but before that you have to teach them how to look at each other in the eye too now let me show you the other way that i get to independent conversation um i'm gonna risk um uh trying to get this all done before we run out of questions but um does anyone have any other questions before i go on to this next part of things no okay I like music. Do you like music? You like music. Does he like music? He likes music. Does she like music as a basic conjugation practice? I like classical music. I like jazz music. Any kind of variations you want to do to this, okay? Tell them, okay, you know what I want you to do? I want you to just learn how to speak really quickly. Forget all of the other pronouns. Pronouns will only be, I like music. Do you like music? And they do that with each other. So one person says, I like music. Do you like music? You like me. I'm um, sorry. I like music. Do you like music? I like music. Do you like music? I like music. Do you like music? And they're all going, getting confused going, why are we repeating that? Well, because I want you to repeat so you can go faster. So to repeat more, repeat, I like music two times. So it'll go like this. I like music. I like music. Do you like music? I like music. I like music. Do you like music? I like music. I like music. Do you like music? Teaching them to repeat 
is useful for more than just pronunciation practice or speed practice. If you frame it properly, you can tell them that if you want to be understood and you're trying to say something, okay, repeating is the best way to reinforce your communication level. If you say it only once and you have a small voice, you have bad pronunciation, you're going to give your partner only one chance to understand. You say it twice, you're going to double your, your, uh, your chance to actually convey what you wanted to say. So when you're in doubt communicatively, just repeat what you just said. Yeah, well, you guys are pretty good at that. Okay. How about three times? Three times. Now, your challenge now is to not sound like a robot. Don't say it exactly the same way every time. Don't say, I like music. I like music. I like music. Do you like music? Say it like uh, you're surprised. Oh, I like music. Say it like you're angry. I like music. I like music. Say it like uh, you're brokenhearted. Say it like you just fell in love. Say it like uh, you just found a dog by the side of the street. But whatever you do, say it differently every time. And they'll do a couple of practices of that, and they're going to get really tired of saying, I like music. Now, at this point, I'll tell them, okay, so now I want you to do this. I want you to choose how many times you repeat, I like music. And they go, how many times? What do you mean? Not three? Not four? No, not four. Okay. As many times as you want, because you have one more thing that you have to do. Okay. You, oops, sorry, sorry, sorry. I jumped the gun on something here. Okay. So you have one more thing that you have to do. Okay. You have to take that repeated word. Okay. I like music. I like music. I like music. And while you repeat it, okay, I want you to think of a new word, any word, anything that can fit into that object position. I like blue, you know, the color blue. I like the blues. I like sports, I like pizza, I like Fukuoka, whatever. Now that new word, okay, you want to make sure that your partner understands it because they're gonna be using it themselves. So that's something you should repeat at least once or twice yourself. Once your partner goes, oh, okay, okay, good. You're gonna be able to tell that they understand it. You just have to ask the question once. And once you, oops, sorry, I keep jumping ahead, sorry. Ah, sorry, sorry, sorry. I keep jumping ahead. I keep pushing on the wrong thing here. And then once you ask the question with the new word, the, the partner will receive that new word and then use that as their repeat word until they can come up with a new word. So it would go like this. And I would demonstrate it with my imaginary friend with my students too, until I go to the actual student. I like music. I like music. I like music. I like music. I like hamburgers. I like hamburgers. I like hamburgers. Do you like hamburgers? Ah, I like hamburgers. I like hamburgers. I like hamburgers. I like America. I like America. I like America. Do you like America? And just for the sake of time, I'm going to keep that short. But that's what you would do to get them to start bringing in their own ideas to these, to these structures. Once you get them to talk about that, okay, then you can start throwing in negation. Like, I don't like coffee. 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 I like tea. I like tea. I like tea. So they have to negate the repeating section, but the new section is something that naturally they'll think of something they like and they say that first. Then you switch the negation. You make the negation into the new word and you make the statement, the repeating statement positive again. Then you can start showing how to use and and but to elongate that uh, three word sentence into a seven word sentence. I like coffee, I like coffee, I like coffee. Ah, I like coffee, I like coffee and I like tea. I like coffee and I like tea. And now they're practicing a seven word sentence every time they re-utter that. It makes it very, very long. It makes it very useful for them to actually practice more fluency. If you look at the left-hand side of that blackboard, I show them um, some basic uh, preferences. Uh, statements of preference that they can use to practice with the neutral point being between I like a little bit and I don't like very much. That's where you sit your neutral point. But after that, it becomes to the extreme of I love or down to the extreme of I hate. And sometimes you have to cajole them into actually practicing it. But generally, I leave it up to them as long as they use one uh, in every turn. Once they get up to that point, then we start talking about topics. In this case, my family. I like my family. I like my family. I like my family and I like my sister. I like my family and I like my sister. Now, the other person might not have a sister. 
So now they have to switch the verb. Do you have a sister? If they're asked, do you have a sister? Then they have to repeat, I have a sister, I have a sister, I have a sister, or I don't have a sister, I don't have a sister. Then they say that I don't have a sister. Then they go down. You can follow that purple line too. But I like my brother. I don't have a sister, but I like my brother. Or I have a sister. I love my sister. I love my sister, but I don't like my little brother. That sort of thing. And it starts to become... The problem is holding all of these variables in your head with these utterances that you want to say. And it gets even more complicated from there because then you go to family, then you go to uh, aspects of their character, you go to um, grammar to show what kind of possessions they have, the colors of those possessions. And at a certain point, they're going to become so fluid, so fluent with this exercise that they're able to make conversation. I know that I'm compressing all of that like into a very broad statement, like they're going to go from here all the way to independent conversation. It, it isn't ex like that exactly, but I'm running out of time. Um, but if you take the scaffolds and you move them slowly, you move them uh, and you experiment and you feedback, you know, you self-reflect like Adam did. Why did I have that problem going into independent conversation? You think about their needs and these things will become very natural to you. You get to the point where all you have to do is just write up a topic on the board in this case, high school, remind them you want to speak quickly, you want to repeat to clarify your point, you want to add information, you want to uh, show what that information is in terms of your likes or your dislikes, and cut down on the number of questions. You don't need to constantly be asking questions. And you're going to be having a conversation about high school, high school, a couple of rounds of high school, and a couple of rounds of sports. And um, then the, you'll be able to uh, get from sports uh, to, to, to America, to music, to all of these daily conversation topics that actually are far more important for them to become familiar with than things like, sorry to say, climate change, the SDGs, world economics, which is what a lot of textbooks wants them to do, and their administrations want them to do because that's their program. However, what is more likely for them in terms of a conversation with their newly found American exchange student friend? Are they immediately going to have a conversation about the SDGs or climate change, or are they probably going to exchange information about the sports teams that they like? They need to be able to do this first with familiar everyday topics, then maybe take that same mindset and then throw it uh, towards, yeah, science or technology or computers or SDGs. Now, I'm going to jump back to where we were before. So after you've gotten that word throw, okay, or after you've gotten to the, um, to the, the, the switching and then the independent conversations, another practice that you can do is... My jaw drops every to jaw when I look at the topics in speaking textbooks. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you and me both, Steve. Um, is the 30 second talk. Now, some of you are familiar uh, with um, what Paul Nation uh, called his fluency speech, where he said, I make my students do a four minute speech. And then they take that same four minute speech and take it down to a three minute speech. And then uh, that makes, that forces them to become ever more fluent because they have to take the same amount of content that was in four minutes into two minutes. I didn't even have to try that in my classroom to know that even with my best students, if I just suddenly told them, okay, talk for four minutes on a topic that they would run dry in a minute and a half. And I thought to myself, wow, Paul Nation must have some really, really fluent students, or he did a lot of scaffolding and preparation to get to that four minute speech first. I thought to myself, with the students that I have to maintain the, um, the atmosphere that I, that I want to maintain in my classroom, which is to stay away from pens, to stay away from papers. Uh, the beginning of verbal classrooms was no textbooks, don't need any textbooks. Now I've learned to make my peace with textbooks, but also still the idea that we just go from independent conversation. Let's say sports. These kids are having conversations on sports. And I tell them that instead of you know four minutes, what I do is I tell them, okay, now we're gonna split this up into rows, okay? We've got one row that's near the door, another row that's near the windows. Okay, the door side. When I say go, you're gonna talk for 30 seconds on sports. Basically what you just said before, and the window side, you guys are just gonna listen. When it's 30 seconds, I'll clap once to say stop. 
Okay. All you have to do is just keep talking. Just talk about sports, anything that you can. Speed, repeat information. Ready? Go. Time that off. 30 seconds. Stop. Okay. Window side, it's your turn. You do your 30 seconds. Door side, just listen. Ready? Go. 30 seconds. And we make them switch. And if I feel they have to reinforce, we do the same 30 seconds again. And I say, hey, whatever you said just before, perfect. No problem. It's going to be hard. You have to remember the entire sequence of things that you said for 30 seconds, but great. Practice that. Pardon me. Practice that again for another round. And then we go to the next step, which is in my case, the sequence is to climb up. Okay. 30, 45, 60, 120 seconds down to 60 seconds. You could also do this if you feel that it's a nice scaffolded step to go 30, 45, 30. All right. So they... They started out at 30, 45, another 15 seconds of information. Now they take that entire 45 seconds of information, crush it down to 30, then move on to another topic. Now, if you've got some pretty good students and they have no problem speaking fluently at 30 seconds, challenge them to keep going to 30, 60, 120, down to 60, down to 30. So my version of nation speech practice doesn't go down a descending stair step from an immediate summit. We climb to the summit, then come down uh, the other side of the mountain. And generally, um, you have a, a lot more success, I find. This is something that I do with TOEIC level 400 students, uh, you know, the, depending on motivation and depending on scaffolding. Um, if you've given them enough Quizlet sets, if you've given them enough um, relevant uh, uh, sentences to practice earlier on, they can handle that 30, 45, 60 thing very, very well. You can also start doing other monologues, other uh, bits of work that they can do. Um, once you've got that, you, like I said, you switch topics, you uh, introduce new um, statements of formal uh, argumentation, like, well, I don't believe that to be true as an introductory one. Nonetheless, therefore, segue words, all kinds of things that you can practice beforehand, and then they can start learning how to throw them in there well. Uh, I got another one here from Adam. Develop the utterances before squeezing. Yeah, sure. Uh, and then keep uh, revisiting fluency with something I call fluency charting, which is where they actually take a chart, a piece of paper. And as the person is speaking for that 60 seconds or 30 seconds, the other person is just drawing a line, a steady line. And when the person speaking stops or utters a disfluency, they lift the pen, although the hand is still moving. And when they start speaking again, they drop the pen. So you can see on a chart where they were not talking, where they were talking. If somebody was talking very smoothly, then there's lots of ink there. If somebody was like constantly stopping, you'll see a lot of white spaces. Um, you can, you don't have to be afraid of speaking Japanese. As a matter of fact, with the really difficult things like the fluency charting um, uh, instructions, or when you have to talk about the difficult aspects of fluency, the whole concept of what fluency is and why maybe they're not fluent now in, in this classroom because of the things they didn't do in high school, then yeah, go ahead, do it in L1. If you need to do it in L2, you can try, but I think it's perfectly okay to do it in L1. I would get a lot of flack before uh, for actually, you know, I'm a Canadian and I'm, I'm a native English speaker. I don't like that term, but it's convenient. Um, and I speak English fluently, but I teach in Japanese. What are you doing, Mr. Curtis? Well, my philosophy is that in terms of production, the language that the instructor speaks is not at all important to the kid's progress. What is important is how much time they spend in L2, not how much time I spend in L1. If I can cut down the amount of time or if I can explain more precisely what we're doing to get more buy-in from the students because I'm using L1, I got no problem with that as long as they do their best to stay in L2. Now, of course, sometimes they're going to be speaking in L1. Can't help that. They're going to get up. They're going to switch. They're going to be laughing, making jokes, sort of ribbing each other about mistakes they were making before. That's no problem. That's good, healthy banter in the classroom. But with verbal classrooms, they have probably never spoken that much L2 English before ever in a, in a, a proper English classroom, whether it be 90 minutes or 50 minutes. 
once you get them up to those independent conversations, like those that video of those kids that was blurred out that I showed early on in the presentation, then you get to the other aspect of this, which is uh, semester assessments. A semester assessments, okay, this is um, uh, uh, my semester assessment form. You can see in the rubric, actually, I'm because I can't um, zoom in on this, I'm going to escape that and set that share up again so that then I can actually zoom in on this. Uh, you can see in this rubric that the rubric says nothing about grammar and accuracy, none at all. You want them to communicate, so they have to be able to understand each other. And as the observer, the instructor observing the group conversation, you can tell that. But I just want to show you, there's no emphasis at all on um, conversational um, accuracy. Using this assessment method, there are a lot of advantages to it. One, you're going to have a lot less take-home marking because you observe them. You assign a number grade to those four aspects. Okay, and the four aspects are them being able to speak equally and naturally. So no memorization, no speeches. Everybody speaks. If it's a three-person group, one-third, 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 one-quarter, 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 one-quarter. If it's a four-person group, obviously. You're looking and grading them on their style, which is how um, you know clearly they speak, how loudly they speak, how they look into each other's eyes, how they look friendly and approachable and not a bunch of nervous Nellies um, wishing that they were finished this test and um, having, uh, having fun and speaking quickly and having fun. These are the four things that I mark them on. But if they speak any utterance of Japanese, that's why it's in red, they get penalized as a group. Hopefully that will get them to the point where they start to understand that they're a team and they have to help each other. And if one person is speaking a lot of Japanese during their impromptu practices outside of class and that person has to be told, hey, listen, buddy, you got to pull your own weight because you know, you're going to be dragging us down with you. And even if they don't, they understand that conversation is something that's done not by yourself, alone, at a desk, memorizing words. It depends on what the other person does. Okay. The students also, here's another advantage, they receive immediate feedback on their test. They know exactly how they did on the test. In the first semester, you set up this test so that then um, you as the instructor are simply there observing and grading. In the second semester, you actually participate. So they have to be able to hear what you say, understand what you say, and be able to participate in a group conversation with uh, um, a fluent speaker as one of the participants. I'm going to send this back to um, the play mode. So I will uh, create a stop share and create a new share. OK, and uh, let's see here. So I'll just very quickly go through that again. You get less take home marking. Students receive immediate feedback. And uh, those are the, the two types of tests that I do. Now, there were the two unrehearsed conversations. Each one is about five minutes, OK? And each one is on a different topic. The topics themselves come from a topic list of 10, and they're the types of topics I was talking about before. Family, sports, music, Japan, food, university life, high school, stuff that's really, really everyday and shouldn't present no problem in terms of vocabulary. If you want to make sure the vocabulary is reinforced, that's what Quizlet is for. That's what um, the warm-up exercises are for at the, at the beginning of the class. Stay away from emphasizing grammar and vocabulary, unless you have to, because you know it's part of your four skills course. But when you're actually in the verbal classrooms uh, exercises, if they make a few grammatical mistakes, especially with higher level stuff that you've never uh, practiced before, try to let it slide. What I don't let slide, okay, are the things that we actually were supposed to be targeting, like the third person singular, the S sound or the Z sound at the end and the proper conjugation. So if they say something like, my father go, I say, nope, think about it. Ah, my father goes, and they let them uh, self-correct. Uh, and in the test, as I said before, Japanese usage is extensively penalized. If they make one word, one utterance of Japanese, five points taken from their 100 score. So they know that they mustn't speak any Japanese. And by the end of the semester assessment, it might be the very first experience for some of these students to actually speak only English in a five-minute conversation. Quite an achievement for some of these kids who've never done that before. If you're going to do this, remember that the mindset that you have to adopt is the idea that fluency has to come first. 
and accuracy is set aside, you can go to accuracy as a separate target, maybe in between the fluency sessions, or maybe just say fluency only for the next 15 weeks, and then we'll look at accuracy in the second semester if you're still with them as students. Approach it as a set of skills. It is not something that you give them as knowledge or you don't tell them, well, you know, your grammar sucks. Go do some more drills out of that book. That's not how it's going to work in this case because we're talking about speaking. If you want to practice the relative pronoun, get them to practice a lot of relative pronouns by saying it and saying it the same. If you're not careful though, there are some pitfalls. And the first one of them is that you don't connect this to your class materials or that to the students, it seems like there's no connection to other class materials, or there's no connection to the common test if you're teaching this in high school. So you have to keep telling them why it's connected. You have to keep telling them fluency is everything. And if you don't want to be like your uh, the, the other Japanese students who've graduated this high school before you, this, uniform, this university before you, um, you have to be able to speak to a degree so that your retention of English is going to be much stronger after you graduate. You must try to find a way to incorporate some kind of speaking test at the end of the semester. If you just do this as practices, it's not that it doesn't have value, but the kids, if they look at their syllabus and they go, wait a minute, there's no speaking test here. The entire course is um, just these um, grammar quizzes online and um, the, the Moodle tests. Why are we studying this? Ah, oh, geez, man, I don't have to take this very seriously. So I have to try to find a way to create some kind of final assessment to make this worth uh, their while. Um, your scaffolding, uh, if it's not careful, and they, at some point, have enough experiences where they go, oh, man, I, I was too hard. They're going to lose heart. And they're going to start thinking that uh, I don't know what's coming next, but I might fail. Oh, no, I'm the next person in the demonstration lineup. Oh, no, I can't stand it. But on the other hand, if they all feel that your teacher, Cruz, is never going to give us anything that we can't do, or he's going to give us something hard, but in the end, we're going to be able to do it, if they lose that idea, then you're going to start losing uh, the buy-in that you had before. And remember, you've got to sell this idea. You've got to get them to start thinking in a different way, just like you did. Because up to now, for them, uh, this has always been about um, this. English has always been about vocabulary and tests and memorization and strategies to get past uh, the TOEIC test and make sure you stay awake for the whole two hours. Now it's actually about speaking. And you have to be able to explain that to them very well. Um, you have to be careful if you're a JTE or sorry, if you're an ALT or uh, maybe somebody that works in a very tightly controlled environment, you really do need to have buy-in by the other teachers. Okay. Um, let's see. Was there, I'm going to skip to this slide. Um, Mary Uchida is here and uh, she will tell you that um, she had a lot of success with this and um, she's had a lot of success with this with little kids which I think says a lot because little kids can be very difficult to teach, even though they're very enthusiastic. Jenny Crittenden, a friend of mine, teaches at Fukuoka High Schools. She's no longer in ALT. She's uh, got her own uh, classroom as an English teacher. Uh, Catherine Akasaka teaches at junior high school and at university. And you all know, I'm sure, uh, Adam Jenkins at uh, Shizuoka Institute of Science and Technology. They all vouch for it. It all worked for them well. Um, uh, I hope to be able to keep adding more information on my website and in my presentations about the other things that I do. Um, the reason why I'm not able to talk about those so much is because I often am speaking in front of new audiences and I have to talk about the basics first so that you understand what it is that's going on. But as I go on through time, I'll be adding more information to my Facebook page, uh, to my Goldfish365 website. Uh, there I am there on my URL too. And up above is my email address if you want to stay in touch with me. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, uh, for your kind attention. And from here, uh, hopefully, I've um, stimulated your brains enough to make you want to come up with a few questions that you might want to ask me. So feel free to just open up your mics, open up your cameras, and uh, just uh, throw those questions out there or raise your hands. Uh, people are lining up with questions. I'm perfectly happy with that too.